Inter Miami had the weekend off to rest and prepare, and now comes a really grueling stretch that may just determine how the season plays out. Hello everybody and welcome to the latest episode of Miami Total Football Radio, aka Miami Total Football Radio. I am half of the co-hosting team of this pod, the number one Inter Miami pod that's out there. I'm Franco Panizo, and joining me this week is not Steve Brenner. El Primo is once again not in the building. I think it has something to do with England losing the Euros over the weekend. No, I'm just kidding. Steve is on assignment. He's back in New York City, so he will not be around this week or next. But we have a very worthy person filling in for him. And that is none other than Kobe Price, the former Inter Miami beat writer. Because, well, as we'll get to, Kobe is moving on to a different beat with the Sun Sentinel. Kobe, I know you've been a longtime listener of the show. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing, brother? I know I've been trying to get you on for several months now. We've talked about it, but finally it's here. So how are you and how does it feel to finally be on Miami Total Football Radio? What's up, man? Yeah, I've been listening since the beginning, since the inception. It's kind of crazy. I'm going to listen to this, obviously, you know, the next day it comes out. I'm going to be like, oh, my gosh, it's, I'm actually on the podcast. It's <laughs> crazy. It's ridiculous. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm it's good, a milestone. I'm, it's a feather in your cap. Yeah, I can knock it off my checklist of accomplishments. You know, I put came on, down to South Florida. Put it on the myself, resume. Put it on the resume. <laughs> exactly. It'll be the first thing appeared on the Miami Twitter football radio. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, man. Glad to be here. Glad to, uh, you know, even as the former beat writer, you know, I still got the knowledge in the cranium. So I'm going to come with the knowledge tonight. But, you know, feeling good, feeling good. And just glad to be here. How you doing? I'm good, brother. Thank you for asking me. Uh, you know, we've I met you last year when we started this whole thing um, covering Inter Miami before its inaugural season. And we got along right off the bat. I remember being in L.A. with you uh, for the, the first game, the first game in the club's history right and afterwards we went to in and out and had a good old meal there and talked about the season that was to come not knowing obviously what everything that was going to happen in the in the ensuing months now for the people that don't know where are you going you are because you like we said you're no longer going to be the inter miami beat writer but you're staying with the sun sentinel and you're just moving to a different beat so for those that would like to know where is Kobe Price headed? What work can they follow now? You can still, I mean, on Twitter, still the same. Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. But I'm moving over to uh, the Miami Hurricanes beat. I'll be covering, you know, everything Miami Hurricanes. Football, basketball, baseball, you name it. I'll be covering it. I'll still be covering the Miami Heat, um, helping out with the coverage for that as well. So that's that's me. I'm excited for this next journey. Uh, been down here since September 2019, so just the next step in my next step in my journey and looking forward to it and i'm gonna say this off the top so before we get into everything everybody who's read or follow my work follow my coverage uh, of the inner miami i very much appreciate whatever it was whether it was interacting through twitter uh through twitter reading my stories if you had gave me feedback if you just wanted to banter whatever it is i appreciate you uh, you were noticed and yeah, just keep following along if you are a UM fan. Even if you aren't a UM fan, just follow along anyway. I, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, no no doubt. Kobe d did a good job with Inter at Miami. I'm sure he'll do a heck of a job um, covering UM. We will miss you on the beat, no doubt, brother. Um, but like I said, we will still have to hang out aside from that, and we'll get you on the pod on occasion as well so that you can still be part of the Miami Total Football Radio family. But Kobe... We have a lot to talk about because not only is Inter Miami about to start a very crucial part of its season that Phil Neville had said may or may not determine whether the team makes the playoffs, but there's also some there's also some news that came out last week with regards to ownership and what might be going on behind the scenes. So there's a lot to talk about. So let's get to it. Okay, Kobe, so let's start with the report from The Athletic that came out towards the tail end of last week, and that is that Marcelo Claude and Masayoshi Son, two of Inter Miami's co-owners, are apparently looking to sell their stakes in the franchise. Now, according to that report, Claude's relationship with Jorge Mas has been rocky for some time, 
and that's all that was said there but it looks like he's looking for a way out as is Masayoshi's son did this take you by surprise at all you've been around the team as I have on a very regular basis was this surprising to you or no it, it wasn't really surprising if you've noticed even without talking to many people about this if you've noticed um, you know Clare especially hasn't really been as involved with the club he's kind of just be up front he's been distanced he's distanced himself from the team mm -hmm. hasn't really posted about the team uh, I mean I don't think he attended the season opener and that was back in what April April, April yeah. yeah so mid-April so haven't seen him around to be frank uh haven't really seen him you know promote the team or same distance yeah so didn't really surprise me sometimes you get to ownership and you realize it's not for you and maybe you know if, especially when you're a minority or uh not a controlling owner i should say the team goes in a direction that you're not liking obviously Jorge Mas is the managing odor managing odor of the club so maybe they don't like the direction maybe they see that this is a let's just be kind and say it's been a rough start <laughs> to to the inception of this club and they're like yeah let's let's we're not getting our investment we're not getting our money's worth we're gonna dip and it could be as simple as our relationship with the main owner um or governor of the team rather is not you know is is just not working. Yes. Yeah, so for me, I wasn't surprised by the news because, like you said, we've been around the team as close as anybody has, especially as of late. Now that they've kind of led us back in to being around the team, at least from uh, from afar and at on at training and for other events. And Marcelo Claudia hasn't been seen by and large, even dating back to last year. So he's been pretty much a distant owner absentee owner as some people like to like to use the term so i'm not entirely surprised by this we never even got to meet masayoshi's son i don't know if he's ever even came to south florida for for any games or anything of the like never met him obviously the relationship with mas that that report that part of the report is interesting now for some backstory because i've been covering the team obviously not on a daily basis i was living in new york at the time but i've been following them very closely since David Beckham announced he wanted to do this whole thing. I was actually at the initial press conference when David Beckham made the announcement with Don Garber that they wanted to start this team or this this franchise. And Marcelo Claudio was David Beckham's right-hand man. They were seen together at Miami Heat games when this was during the LeBron era or towards the end of the LeBron era. There's pictures of them if you Google LeBron um, if you Google David Beckham Marcelo Claudio, there's pictures of them at the Heat game shaking LeBron's hand and they were they were in it from the start. Now, in in late 2017, early 2018, that's when Jorge Mas was brought on board, and he was brought in as the guy with the local ties. Even though Marcelo Claudia has his local ties, Jorge Mas was sold as this as the guy who has more local ties and maybe even more financial backbone that can help push this push this project uh, to the next level because it was at risk, it was at jeopardy of not happening. So, look, for me, I think what happened was they brought Jorge Mas on board. He's the one that's really put down a lot of money and it became Jorge Mas's team. Jorge and Jose Mas's team. And David Beckham's still involved. He's still the face. He's still the guy that is... No soccer more than maybe the rest of the owners. He's played in it in his life. He's worked in it his entire life. So he still has that knowledge, brings that to the table. But I think with Jorge Mas coming on board, that kind of made Marcelo Claudio take a step back. And, you know, if they didn't, I mean, if apparently they didn't see eye to eye on some things, well, I can see why Marcelo Claudio wants, wants out now because it's not his team, so to speak, right? This is more of a Jorge Mas, Jose Mas team. Um, and for better or for worse, whatever your opinion is on it, that's pro that seems like it's going to be the direction that the team is headed in, obviously with David Beckham still still involved. I'm glad you mentioned that because sometimes I feel like there is that misconception about, you know, obviously you see David Beckham a lot. You see David, like, this is face. You see his jersey in the team store, et cetera, et cetera. But the the financial backing of this club is Jorge and uh, – Jorge Mas and Jose Mas, but especially Jorge Mas, sure. he is he is on the um, he represents Inter Miami on what the Board of Governors. Yeah. Uh, so this is very much you know we may see David Beckham a lot, and he very much especially I would imagine this past year he said it himself he's going to be more involved with the club. However, 
this is a Jorge Mas operated and ran club. Absolutely. That needs to be. I, I want. I just want that to be hundred percent clear. I just want that to be. Yeah. No sure. doubt. No. Absolutely. No doubt. Because I feel like there's sometimes this misconception. Like, why is David allowing this? What, what's going on? Sure. David may be involved. David may even be an owner. He may be even listed as the president of the club. Whatever that's supposed to mean when you have a whatever uh, Chris Henderson on there. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever that. But this is a Jorge Mas operated and run club. I just want to put that out there when, while we're still on this topic. No, so. absolutely, absolutely. It's worth it's worth emphasizing because look, David Beckham is the name. He's the brand. Right. He's got the the star power, the the sexy factor, the worldwide recognition that nobody else in the Inter Miami ownership group has. And it's obvious, and it's written. Obviously, it's written at David Beckham's club. It's written a lot. David Beckham's team. Um, David Beckham, the owner. But he's not the majority owner in this. He's he is the face. He helps bring attention and brings out the cameras. And we've seen the coverage that Inter Miami gets when David Beckham is making an appearance. It's substantially larger than when it's just the team doing its, you know, its own thing, whether it's a normal practice or whether it's even uh, sporting director Chris Henderson speaking or Jorge Mas speaking. When David Beckham's involved, a lot more people are interested. So David Beckham is presented in that way, and he uses him his brand in that way to help obviously draw interest in the team but like you said this is a jorge and jose mas team with jorge mas obviously being the lead the lead figure because and here's another example inter miami had their holiday party last year who was the owner that was president was present at this holiday party jorge mas it was not david beckham it was not marcelo claude it was it was jorge mas that was there that addressed everyone jorge mas is there Every single game, he's very involved. He's a very forward-facing owner, which is not a bad thing because if you have, if you look around the league, there are teams and clubs and fan bases that wish they had owners that were around as often and as involved as often because you could be like the New York Red Bulls, who Inter Miami play this weekend, that their owners are never around, and you know there's there's like a disconnect there between the fan base and a feeling like you know they don't care, the ownership doesn't care, so. Jorge Mas, for better or for worse, whatever you think of the state of the team and the direction of the team, he's around, he's invested, and he wants to get this thing going in the right direction. Obviously, it hasn't gone very smoothly. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if he buys those those stakes, because in the report it also said he was interested in buying those stakes from Claudia and Masayoshi Sun. Be curious to see how much that's worth, because Inter Miami is the... One of the sexier teams in MLS, even with the lack of results, because it's tied to David Beckham, because of the brand, because of the city and the market, it is one of the sexier, quote-unquote, teams in MLS. So be very curious to see how much that goes for. We'll see how that, that plays out. But let's let's switch gears now and talk about on the field, because we primarily care more about what happens on the field with this team more than in, in the executive boardroom. This team, and this is something we touched on last week, and I think we need to touch on it a little bit more this week, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts because we haven't really spoken about it. This team is in a bad way. We know this. But the attack is really, really, really bad. They have the lowest amount of goals this season. They have a total of nine goals in 11 games. That is the worst total this season so far. I think the next the next lowest or the next fewest amount of goals comes from Austin FC, the expansion team, and they have 10. Inter Miami has very good attacking players on its roster. Whether they complement each other or not is another story. But how does this attack get better for you, Kobe? I know you're leaving the beats here. Like, I don't know. I don't even want to put my brain into it. But <laughs> what what do you think this team can do to get better in the attack? Everything. I mean, I, I and I say that slightly jokingly, but at the same time, we have to ask ourselves what what does this team do well, um, and kind of start from there, like start from the bottom and work your way up. Because sometimes I feel like we look at it from starting at the top, and working our way down. They are in the opposite because you said they're at the bottom of the barrel. And I mean, another stat to throw out: I think if you do per ninety, they're they're the second worst the, in terms of goals per ninety minutes. So. Not the best place to be. They they don't, you know, and this it goes to a fold. You know, the lack of possession, it hurts them defensively because they're always, you know, allowing teams to come at them. But at the same time, they're not creating many chances. There's not a whole lot of 
not a whole lot of good combining. Not a whole lot of good combining from, you know, from maybe it's either John McCarthy starting it up or maybe it's one of the, the center backs, one of the fullbacks starting it up. There's not a whole lot of play from the back line through the midfield, maybe out to the wing, and then coming back in. Or even from the back line midfield to to, uh, to Higuain or Carranza up top. There's not a whole lot of just tactical and deliberate building up. And it's not cons- and if there is, it's a flash. And you we think, oh, sure. this is what they could look like consistently. No, it's not con- they don't do it consistently enough sure. for it to be effective. And even I mean, this is what I'm saying, it's everything because even when they do have those moments, you know, you have moments where a guy gets in front of a goal and he just doesn't finish the shot. We saw that we saw that a couple times with Gonzalo Guayim back in against Atlanta United. I'm not calling him out specifically. He, that just came to my mind right here. <laughs> we saw with Jay Chapman, um, I forget which game that was, but it was, a, it was one of the recent games that they had. I believe it would have been against Orlando or Montreal, I want to say. Orlando. Like was, Orlando, yeah. I was about to say, I, feel, I felt like it was a home game. And not to say it's just on them, because nobody besides, I mean, nobody really besides Gonzalo Guayim has really produced in the, in the attack in the way that they're expected to. Lewis Morgan, he's he's I think he's been good all season. He has one goal and one assist through what, eleven games? Yeah, eleven yeah. games. So even as good as or solid as me have been just creating opportunities, he hasn't provided that um, that final quality as a goal scorer um, in the way that you know not that just we as media or maybe fans expect him to, but Lewis himself will tell you sure. he expects double digit and double assist uh, goals and assists every year. So that's something he has improved in. Rodolfo Pizarro hasn't scored. Because like Guayin, he's been better this year, but he still leaves something to be desired from a goal scoring opportunity. It's actually wild when you look at his stats, though, because he's he's performed. I think he has half of, more than half of these goals. I think he has five of the of the nine goals this season, and that's with all the issues that they're having in the attack. Look, for me, there, there's... There's terms in Spanish that are used in soccer, which when I hear them in Spanish, I'm like, man, that 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 actually explains it perfectly. But in English, they don't necessarily have or they're not used as commonly. So I'm going to try to translate and use some of them here to, to help understand why Inter Miami is struggling. And one thing we touched on last week with Steve, El Primo, who you know very well from from, <laughs> from the days on the on the beat. Um, when, right. you're, when you're sweating in the 90 degree weather, <laughs> when, when your Chicago blood can't take it anymore, and you're like hiding in the shadow. Anybody who listens to this to this pod right now, I have to say this: Kobe is a Chicago guy through and through. And whenever he's gone out to training, he's literally like practically melting after five minutes in the sun. It's 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 a sight to behold. <laughs> no, no. You, what you can't tell him is that I'll tell him for myself is that I think it was more than more recent trainings, training session we got to view. I was out in practice. It wasn't even that hot. It wasn't even that bad, like, compared to what it usually could be. I had to, like, step out the sun, like, go into, like, the nearest shake because I was just dying. It might have been, like, a moderate hot day in South Florida, but I could just not I could just not do it. I could not stand it. I was not here <laughs> for it. I'm never here for it. This sun is ridiculous. I enjoy the indoors when I'm down here. That, Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> that AC is booming. The AC is booming in Kobe, in Kobe Price's car. Regardless of where he is in South Florida, hey, it's that Chicago blood, man. It's, I don't, I don't blame you because if I, you know when I was in New York, I didn't really like the cold all that much either. But look, going going back to the terms in terms of the attack, first of all, they lack profundity, profundidad. They don't they don't get into the final third very often. They don't penetrate. It's one of the basic concepts in soccer, which is penetration when you have the ball, and they don't penetrate often enough. So that is one problem that they have. Another problem that they have is. No tienen efectividad. They don't have efficiency or they're not effective enough in the final third when they do have their chances. They don't put their chances that they have away on a regular basis. They put them wide. They put them close to the goalkeeper. They hit the post. Whatever it is, they don't put enough of the chances that they do have away. And sometimes in soccer, you might not have a whole lot of chances. So you need to be efficient with the ones you do have to give yourself a chance to win. So there are... Those are two key problems for Inter Miami. Now, touching on now individual players and, and moments, you touched on Lewis Morgan. Look, for me, he's obviously been one of the better players so far this season, but even but he's a level or two lower than where he was last year. And I, part of it might be on him, and part of it, to me, is on the coaching staff because last year, he was at his best when he was dribbling at people in space on the right side, taking people on one-on-one, whipping in those crosses, and maybe taking in some shots. 
Diego Alonso found, for better or worse, found how to best utilize him or get a good bit out of him. How to squeeze that line and get a lot of juice out of it. Phil Neville, I don't feel like he's doing that. Because how often have we seen Lewis Morgan in one-on-one situations on the right side? They're playing more to his feet. They're not playing him into space. Because there's players that like the ball at their feet. Rodolfo Pizarro is one of those players. Give him the ball at his feet. He's that type of player. Not necessarily someone that's going to, with speed or with pace, make those runs in behind and stretch the defense. But with Lewis Morgan, we're not seeing that. I don't think we've seen that this season where they're hitting balls into space, letting him run onto it, getting him in those one-on-one situations so he can dribble by the by a player and, and whip in some crosses, at least not in, often enough. And I think that's one problem that's a microcosm of the, the entire team. Is Are the players being used to the best of their abilities? And if I can interrupt that Lewis Morgan point real quick, uh, we also not see him play as as wide as often as he did last year, because we do have, you know, depending, you know, we have seen multiple lineups used by Phil Neville this year, depending on the lineup, you know, they may put Calvin Leardham back there. And we know Leardham, he likes to be, you know, get wide and get up uh, on the touchline pretty often. So that sends Morgan in a little bit more narrow. So he's coming into the middle of the field more often than he is. Now I know there's someone thinking, I remember seeing Lewis Morgan out wide this, this time. Yes, it's happened, but not as frequently as last year, because last year, they, they just did it wasn't as consistent. It wasn't like Leardom, Leardom is more of an attacking threat. So he likes to be, uh, get wide, can, uh, take up wide areas. And I think Neville likes that from his fullbacks. He likes fullbacks who can get high and wide. Um, but having that may not best suit Lewis. I think, I think it was either Lewis or Leardom who touched on that with us, talking about, you know, getting that rhythm and getting that understanding down with one another about like, all right, so he's going to be up high. I have to be here. Thing, I'm pretty sure it was Leardham, though. But that's just, you know, another adjustment that had to be made by Lewis and by the coaching staff. You're asking me, I think you just asked me, is are they being maximized? Are the players being maximized? Uh, to me, no. And I don't think that means that Phil Neville's doing a bad job uh, coaching or, like, he's doing awful at it. But I know he can do better. I know there are better ways to maximize each individual talent because we saw that last year. You know, we saw a better Rodolfo Pizarro last year. We saw a better Lewis Morgan last year. Yes, Gonzalo Guayin is better, and I think they're getting more out of him. But I also think some of it is Gonzalo Guayin being better no matter like he would have been better this year no matter what. Um, yeah, I'm he, not he sure how scored much, one goal last year, so the, the bar was pretty low. Yeah, I'm not sure how much credit to give to Phil on that one because even I watch him now, and it's very much similar struggles to last year. Like I said, he's doing better this year, and he has what more than half of the team's goals and i think last time i checked and which was before the break so it could have changed he was in the top five or top 10 in goals in mls and yet i still feel like it's not enough like i still feel like they're not maximizing him and he is gonna be maximized which i know for gonzalo Guayin, that's a crazy thing to say yeah but at the same time it's like you if you watch the games watch the games you see him gain a lack of service you see him not being in threatening positions as consistently as sure. he should be and i like the adjustment by To give Phil credit, I like some of the adjustments he's made, whether it's dropping Gonzalo deeper just so they can get a little better control of the game or even inserting Federico Iguain early in the season so they can get better control of the game, be more threatening in the attack. I think that, you know, McCoon as a left back has worked out fine. Has it been great? No. Has it been bad? No. It's been fine. And sometimes with a team like this, you just need to be fine in some areas. However, I know just watching this, uh, watching these games, watching this team from last year to this year, that, and I feel like if you, you know, got some truth serum and as <laughs> Phil, he would tell you, yeah, I could probably figure out um, how to better maximize this team. And that's not, or these individual talents. And that's not a bad thing. That's just an honest thing that we need to acknowledge. Like, yeah, this team can be better maximized because if you don't, if you're looking at this team, I don't, I just won't know, don't know how you can look at this team and say, yeah, this coaching staff is maximizing every single bit of the individual talent because there's a lot of it, but there's still a lot of, you said lime, I'm going to say lemon. There's still a lot of juice in the lemon that hasn't turned into lemonade <laughs> sure. yet. Yeah. I don't Kobe. drink limeade. <laughs> Kobe is very different in his opinions than, than Steve Brenner, the resident co-host. Quite of a different take there when it comes to the coaching staff. And look, I agree with you that if you look at this roster on paper, regardless of everything that's gone on, this team should not be in 13th place in the Eastern Conference. It just should not be that bot, that low 
in the Eastern Conference with that poor of a record, with another five-game losing streak like they had at the start of last year. This should not be Inter Miami's reality, but it is their reality. Look, just to go back to the point you made about Kelvin Leardam overlapping, and you know, I, I do agree that maybe his whiff that he brings maybe pushes Lewis Morgan a little bit more central, but I think it's also by design because... If you look at other teams around the world, you see a fullback that overlaps and the winger can still stay out wide and they combine well. Whereas here, maybe they're still trying to figure that out. But I also think Phil Neville is instructing Lewis Morgan maybe to play a little bit more on the inside in pockets because of how talented he is. Now, I don't think that's the best use of his ability. And I think that negates what he can give you. And that is a problem for Inter Miami because this goes back to last year. They don't have much on the left side in terms of the attack. They're very imbalanced in that way. The right side was Inter Miami's bread and butter with Lewis Morgan last year. They got almost nothing out of the left by and large. They got a few goals from Breck Shea, but from the run of play, you know, in terms of the the function of the team and building out, they didn't get a whole lot on the left side, and they haven't gotten they have not gotten a whole lot out of that left side. So if Lewis Morgan on the right side is not giving you much. That's really going to hurt the team because now you're asking your number 10 to do to do things. And now the number 10s, as we know, have not been doing a great job. Rodolfo Pizarro, Jay Chapman, they're not creating a whole lot. So the team is just struggling in all facets. I think a solution would be get Lewis Morgan the ball in space, in isolated areas where he can take people on one-on-one, penetrate that final third, and obviously look for crosses to Higuain, Julian Carranza, whoever's in the box. Um, I do think that the arrival uh, of Kieran Gibbs will help Inter Miami in the attack and in the buildup because I think he can get forward. He's a natural left back. He'll give you more than Christian McCoon has. Robbie Robinson is returning from this injury that's been plaguing him for these first few months of the season. He's healthy again, is expected to play this weekend. So he will also give them a boost and give them some speed that they lack by and large. So these are pluses that Phil Neville has at his disposal, but Phil Neville has to maximize the the players he has because right now I don't think that he's doing that. This is a better team than last year's team. This is a better team. They, they, obviously, the stats don't show it, but I mean, on paper, the roster, you have Gregory. You know, this team should be better um, than it is right now. And just to go back to the coaching staff standpoint and just maximizing – I want to reiterate, I don't think Phil's doing an awful job because we saw last year, I know you're saying this year's a better team. We saw last year the team, you know, not every single player was maximized last year. Yes, Pizarro finished with, I think, what was it, four goals, five assists. But so a lot of that was built on, like, the first five to six to seven games of the season, and he fell off towards the Mm -hmm. end. Um, Iguain scored one goal in, I think, what, nine games last year. Similar scoring struggles, similar. They don't play. They just don't play extremely well together. They struggle. They struggle to combine last year. They struggle to do it this year. They don't. Their possession, I think, is actually worse this year than it was last year. So similar struggles is just. So some of it is also even though there's talent. Maybe the roster construction may also be to blame, and maybe it feels like trying to think how do I fit these pieces that may not fit the best to make it a more cohesive unit. But while recognizing that may be a construction issue. There's also on the coach to be like, all right, I may not have, you know, the best pieces. I may not have the best, yeah, the best pieces to make this meal, but I start to make the best meal possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that. And look, there's a question I would ask you and I would ask the listeners because I think it's important. I think it's relevant to the state of the team. 11 games into the season, what is Inter Miami's identity? I couldn't tell you. I have no idea what their identity is. They've fought hard in the last few weeks. They've played and scrapped. Sorry, they haven't played. They've played hard and scrapped, but they don't play well, and I don't really know what their identity is. And why that is, I mean, I guess that, that that's a question we should ask Phil Neville maybe this week. I know you won't be around to, to join us in the, in the press conference, but maybe that's a question to ask Phil Neville because I don't know what the identity of this team is. I, have, I honestly couldn't tell you. And I don't know if that's going to take more time with the new incorporations that are coming in. I I just don't know what this team... This team's not a team that likes to counterattack. This team doesn't build up through triangulation and triangles around the field and wall passes one-two. Because, look, there's obviously different ways to go about attacking and playing soccer. 
and you can have your likes or your your gustos, but this, even still, I still don't know what this team proposes on the field. I don't know what they look to do besides be hard to play against. And I think that's a major problem for Inter Miami. I mean, I'm, again, that's just my standpoint. I don't know what you think, unless you have an answer and you think like you know, there's an identity there that that's easily distinguishable. No, I've been wondering the same thing because I know before they even start playing, they were trying to. Their identity was supposed to be this, you know, free flowing, attractive style of play, which that didn't happen. And that's okay to an extent. You didn't live up to the expectation, but. And despite that, they weren't, you know, they didn't live up to many of the expectations. They just weren't that good last year. The stats would show that, you know, in terms of being hard to play against, in terms of being a better defensive team, that, you know, defensively, they're kind of average-ish. They're in line, you know, I think what was it? I, I forgot the number, but their goals per 90 minutes allowed was basically average. It was about middle of the road to MLS, which, okay, that's, that's, that's a starting point. But even when you watch this team, you don't always feel like they're the best defensive team or like a, a high level defensive team. And some of that reflects to me based off, you know, it goes hand in hand, the attack, you concede a lot of possession, you allow a lot of teams to get shots off and just control the game. So you're bound to allow more goals just because you're not like, you're just not in control. But if you're trying to be a team that's hard to play against, which we've seen that up and down a little bit this year and even tab it last year, I don't know if this team specifically is equipped to be almost like Nashville of last year, right? I don't know if they're equipped to be that solid team because Nashville was a pain in the butt to play against, um, especially last year. And we saw how successful they were with that playing style. I don't know if inner Miami feels said this over and over again, being hard to play against that may be the identity they're going for, but I'm not sure if this roster, how it's constructed specifically is best maximized in that way. I so, I have, so, so I don't know what they're – so it's all I have to say. I don't know what their identity is, and that's why they need to fix everything. Yeah, look, I, again, I agree with you here. Um, but by and large, this team is poorly constructed, and this dates back to when before Phil Neville arrived. This dates before Chris Henderson arrived. But it's the roster that they have, and again, it should be better than 13th place. It should be better than 13th place. We'll see what happens now that they get these – players in into the mix Robbie Robinson's back Kieran Gibbs should be available we're speaking to him later this week so they should be back in or they should be in the mix now to play we'll see how much that gives them a boost but again these are just one or two players the whole team needs to be better and I think the the identity needs to be established and clearly defined for what this team is or wants to be because like you said at the beginning of the season they wanted to be free-flowing attack-minded then later on it was you know, maybe be a bit more counterattacking and looking to hit on the break, then it, it just kind of has gone in flux and changed a whole lot. Um, and like you said, if you can't, if you don't keep the ball well and if you don't score and create chances and, and score, then you're bound to face waves of attacks and sooner or later you're going to break down. Maybe there's one game or here and there where you defend well and you keep a zero at the back. You, you defend resolutely, everything goes well for you in that game, there's no controversial calls, there's no bad bounces, no luck, you know, unlucky bounces, but if you are constantly defending, constantly on your heels, you're bound to be exposed at some point. We saw that with England over the weekend, they scored the early goal against Italy, then they kind of went back into a defensive posture, looked to kind of keep a zero at the back, they were doing a great job defensively until that set piece, and then they obviously give up the equalizer, and then they lose on penalty kicks. But speaking of set pieces, and we can close on this, I think that's another problem Inter Miami has. We touched on it last week. Something that they had an issue with last year. They don't score on set pieces. If they could, they would have more goals, and maybe that would open up games for them to 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 score more and win and put them away because that's a facet of the game that's an important facet of the game, and they're not maximizing that either. And that again, goes on to the players as much for me as it does on the coaching staff because maybe the instruction is not being executed properly, but maybe the instruction is also not being, or is not good enough right now. Yeah, I I know this is your corner, the set pieces corner No pun intended, this is your corner. (laughs) (laughs) Good one by me. I'm I'm proud of that one. And I I believe I wrote, I think I might have wrote about this before officially even the B. I know I at least asked about it. 
that the set pieces, I think they were one of a few teams that have only scored one, uh, one goal off a set piece this year. And for those who don't remember or who just may need help remembering, the set piece I'm talking about is from Federico Iwain to Gonzalo Iwain in the second match of the year against the Philadelphia Union. I believe that would have tied the game up yeah. at one. And then Federico Iwain scored the game decider later that match. So uh, that was game two. We're about to go into game 12, and they've yet to score a set yeah. piece since. It's troubling. And I, I, the reason I asked, I think I asked Phil about it and even uh, Jay Chapman about it. Uh, just, you know, I, I noticed, you know, they, they're tw- switching up formations. They're trying new things out because it's clear to them that they just aren't producing in the way that you need to offset pieces. It's just beyond clear. They, they The argument l- last year was that, you know, sometimes they were predictable in terms of the set piece because it really just be, you know, Lewis Morgan just sending in uh, an errant ball into the box that's hoping, you know, it may find someone's head. Now they're, you know, I, they played into the back. They, they're they just trying different things out, but they're trying different things out because they realize we're not we're not producing the way we need to. It's just not working out in terms of the attack. Yeah, there's a lot for Phil Neville and the players to address and work on. And obviously they had a weekend or a week to do so, a week off from games to, to really fine tune things. I was told that they had a intra-squad scrimmage at the end of last week. So they've definitely had... Some time to look at things and work on things. We'll see how it goes ahead of this weekend's game against the New York Red Bulls, which we will touch on next. Let's take a quick break, Kobe, and we'll come back and preview that game. Kobe, we're going to touch on this weekend's game. It's against the New York Red Bulls back at Red Bull Arena where Inter Miami just suffered that recent 1-0 loss to CF Montreal. So Inter Miami will make that trip again back to Harrison, New Jersey and take on the Red Bulls who are in 7th place right now in the Eastern Conference with 17 points, a 5 win, 5 loss, and 2 draw record. Kobe, to start here. What are the keys to the game for you when it comes to Inter Miami? Because look, the New York Red Bulls, I've covered them up close and personal for a lot of my eight years in the Northeast. And they're a team that likes to high press, force turnovers up the field. Inter Miami has shown that it is not that good at building out of the back and needs to play a little more direct to avoid those turnovers. So I'm expecting Inter Miami to go very direct to play balls across the field, switch, you know, switch the point of attack often from to skip lines. Because if you if Inter Miami tries to build out in this one, if they try to play, I think that they're going to be in for a very long day against this very energetic, very young, maybe not flashy, but effective New York Red Bulls team. Yeah, I think we're gonna see a similar game plan, maybe even playing style to the game that they had against DC United after the previous uh three week break where yeah. they lost one to zero. Because I know it was the the Montreal, the Chicago Fire, and the DC game where they just got exposed for, you know, they, they just struggle. Like we said earlier, they struggle in the build up. They sometimes they don't give themselves the options in the back when trying to build out the back line. Sometimes they're a little slow, the reaction time's not there. And you can't do that against a team that's a high press as much as the Red Bulls do. So it's going to be a lot of direct balls. It's going to be, you know, I think it was that in that DC game where I know you wrote about this, you even talked about this, where they sent a lot of balls to Breck Shea on the left um, when it was John McCarthy serving mm-hmm. it up just because, you know, they, what, how tall is Breck? 6'2, 6'3? Yeah, it's pretty tall. Find, find a tall guy, send the header back. Maybe you can get 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 the header down. So, you know, whoever's in the midfield, maybe can send it forward. And that's how you can uh, create something from nothing. I don't think this is going to be a game in which they can, you know, against Orlando, they did a better job of, you know, playing, uh, playing out of the back. But it had to be noted that Orlando City was on short rest that day. And they're not a team that necessarily high presses either, but they were playing on short rest. Yes, both things, both things has to be noted. I'm glad you said it. Uh, cause I would have definitely forgot, um, but yeah, I'm, yeah. So I do think we'll, I think we'll see a similar game plan from that standpoint. Just, I, I don't see why they would change it up. Yes. Yeah, so against Orlando, you change it just because it's a different team, but you would, 
you almost have to play a similar style to what, you know, you saw against DC. Because we even saw this last time against Montreal, um, July 3rd, the attack. It just, they seemed like they tried to switch things up a little bit more because they may have felt good about how they played against Orlando and they were confident. And it just didn't work. It like, it didn't work as well as their game plan against DC. So I think that would be the key. How proficient, how effective they can be with their long ball, uh, long balls and the other part. How quick is their how quick are their decisions? How quick is their timing? How quick are their movements? You have to be able to, you know, find guys. If you're surrounded by, you know, a player and then maybe like three guys are covering your teammates, it's just gonna be a turnover and you're just gonna be losing possession the entire game. Yeah. For me, I think that's the key to the game is avoiding those turnovers and being direct. I think another key will be being efficient, like we touched on the in the previous segment, with the chances they do have. I don't know if Inter Miami is going to have a whole lot of chances. But I think they will have some, and it's about making the most of the ones you do have. I think I've said that in a previous game earlier this season when me and Steve were previewing a match. Efficiency is key for this team because if you're not creating in large numbers, you have to be efficient. You have to be effective uh, and have high efficacy rate here. So that's important. Efectividad, again. Eficaz. Another word that's used in in Spanish when it comes to soccer. That has to be something that Inter-Miami does well in this game if they're going to have any shot to to get a result, let alone win. So Inter-Miami, those are the two keys for me in this game. Because you could say the defense needs to be stout and needs to be hard to play against and all that. But if you don't score, you're not going to win. And like we said... Inter Miami's main issues, at least for me, for my money, is their attack. Their defense, I think, can hold their own, but at some point you need the attack to do its job and take some of the pressure off off the defense. So that those for me are the keys to the game. We don't know what the availability status is of Nick Marsman and Kieran Gibbs will be for the weekend in terms of how many minutes they can play. I imagine that they'll both be available in the travel roster because they're both speaking to the media on Thursday. So, I imagine they'll both be in the roster. I would think Nick Marsman has a higher chance of starting than Kieran Gibbs, just because it's the goalkeeping position. doesn't necessarily need to be as fit as a left back that's going to you know run forward and backward. So, maybe Nick Marsman gets the start. Maybe Kieran Gibbs does not. But I'm curious, what are your lineup predictions for this weekend, Kobe? All right, here we go. Uh, I got Nick Marsman in goal. Okay. I have, so we're, I'm going to do right to left because I, I yes. know that's how it's a pre on this show. <laughs> uh, I have Nico Figal starting at right back. Okay. With Kel- Kelvin leered him out. I, I think uh, Neville might go back to that look. Ryan Shawcross as one of the center backs, LGP as the other, Leandro Gazzaspiras. And then I think because Kieran Gibbs' fitness may not be, he may not be 90 minutes uh, match fit. I think we see the Christian McCoon uh, at left back lineup once again. Now I'm saying this, I would not be surprised if Jovan Jones got the start, just because he, Phil Neville said, you oh, know, we're having a fully fit squad. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to stop you there. I don't think we're gonna see Jovan Jones for a while because, oh, that's right. um, you know, Phil Neville said that a few weeks ago. He, he, it might be a while that, that Jovan Jones is out. You you had tweeted out that he, he had suffered an injury in that Orlando City game. Um, and that looks to be the case because I've seen a couple of pictures since then on social media. One showed Jovan Jones in the knee brace on crutches. So I don't think we'll be seeing him for, for the foreseeable future. Even even uh, Trinidad and Tobago, I think, during one of the preliminaries, Gold Cup preliminaries, they, they held up a shirt when they took their team photo of Jovan Jones's jersey. So, I mean, you don't do that if it's a, if it's a minor injury, right? I, I mean, I don't think you would. So it seems like he's going to he has, he has suffered something pretty serious, and he's going to be out for a pretty pretty long time. So I don't think he'll he'll be he'll be available. But hey, I could be wrong. No, Franco, you're actually right. I'm glad you reminded me of that because I almost I didn't forget, but I forgot how serious the injury was. Mm-hmm. I remember he was knocked up, but I also remember Phil saying he expected a fully fit squad after the break. But I think he also in those comments he did say Jovan's going to be out for a few weeks. So that that's my fault. But yeah, I'm. Either way, I'm going McCoon because I don't think Gibbs will be um, 90 minutes match fit. So that's the back line. Figal, Shawcross, LGP, McCoon. I think we'll see Yoa and Blaze Matuidi, Victor Yoa and Blaze Matuidi as the central midfielders, def- uh, defensive midfielders, uh, kind of like we saw in the Orlando game. Uh, had a good performance then. Maybe they'll have another good one against New York. 
uh, in the midfield, the second midfield, and this is where it actually gets the most interesting to me. Morgan lines up back um, right wing like he has every single game. I think we get Pizarro as the central attacking midfielder in this game just because uh, he, uh, Phil said it before, he's supposed to be fully mm-hmm. fit. Everybody, The whole team's supposed to be fully fit, maybe minus Jovan Jones. So if he's fit, I don't see why he doesn't start. I, I mean, yes, Jay Chapman's had some nice performances um, in that spot. You know, maybe not the most creative, but he's, you know, shown the defensive work necessary. Um, but I just think at this point, if Pizarro's healthy and he's fit and he's had this time to train, he played – um, before the break, I, I think it's time to reinsert him to the starting lineup. I would be surprised if he wasn't a starter. I will have Breck Shea getting the nod as the starting uh, left wing with Gonzale, Gonzale Guayin up top as the forward. So it is a, you know, a four-two-three-one, right there. Okay, so so their usual four-two-three-one um, with Uyoa coming in for Gregory and Shawcross coming into the lineup for. The absent Kelvin Leardam and Nicolas Vigal sliding out right. That's correct. And then Iguain okay. start Iguain going starting back to being a start. Yep. And then yeah. Pizarro in the middle. And then okay. the reason I have Shea out wide is because I thought about I did think maybe Pizarro will be out wide. But going back to our point earlier, I think Inter Miami will need a bigger body on the wing, especially if they're going to be playing so direct. I almost put in Robinson, but similar to uh, I, I do wonder similar to Gibbs, which obviously is different because. Robbie's coming off an injury. Gibbs coming off just time off. I don't know if Robinson will be, you know, match fit. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think Robbie Robinson starts in this one. Although, you know, he's he'll be back. He'll be a weapon that they can use off the bench if he doesn't start, and that could be a, a boost because he's got energy and he's got more speed than most of the players on the roster. So going at tired legs off the bench for 20, 30 minutes is not necessarily a bad thing to have coming um, as a substitute. This is what I think Inter Miami is going to do. Not necessarily what I would do. Just want to make that clear because people will be like, oh, what's Franco talking about? It's not what I would do. It's what I think Phil Neville will do. I think they'll go to that 5-3-2 formation that we've seen in the past. It can also be categorized as a 3-5-2. Depending on how you look at it, they'll move in and out of those looks depending on if they have the ball or don't have the ball. That's just what I think they'll do because we've seen this in the past from Phil Neville. So this is the 11 that I think will make up that formation. Nick Marsman in goal. He gets his first Inter-Miami start and appearance. I think you have Nicolas Figal at right center back, Ryan Shawcross as the middle center back of the three, and then Leandro gonzalez Pires as left center back. Your two wing backs on the right will be Lewis Morgan. On the left will be Breck Shea. The midfield trio will be Blaise Matuidi, Jay Chapman and Victor Uyoa. Obviously, Gregory is out with the accumulation of yellow cards. And then up top, I think you'll have a front two. Your front line will be comprised of Rodolfo Pizarro and Gonzalo Higuain, the two designated players. Obviously, with Pizarro tasked with a little bit more of defensive responsibilities in terms of running around and pressing in, in, that, in that shape. I think Phil Neville made it clear that they're both going to come back into the lineup at the end of last game when he said the players that are expected to create goals and assists, they need to step up now and they need to deliver. So I think they'll both be back in the lineup, and I think that's what we'll see from Inter-Miami. Trying to play long, uh, trying to avoid those costly turnovers at the back that we've seen from them in the past, while also injecting a little bit more quality via Pizarro and via Higuain. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Because, you know, it, it's very, it, it could be also easily, just like you said, go 4 2 3 1. Who are the wingbacks again? Lewis Morgan on the right, Breck Shea on the left. And I don't think, again, this is not what I would do, but I think that that's something we could see from Phil Neville in this one. Lewis Morgan is, you know, I don't think it's necessarily the best position for him because he's not a, a defensive minded player. But I think, you know, with his industry, with his ability to get up and down the, the wing very well, his two way play. I think that's something that that Phil Neville might want to try to take advantage of here, and that's why he might be one of the reasons why he might go with with this look. Kobe, quickly, give me a prediction. Regardless of what formation they trot out or not, does Inter Miami get back on track? Do they put an end to this losing streak? Do they get a win? Maybe even a draw? What do you think? I think they get a result. I think they get a one-one draw. That's my that's my feeling from this match. Uh, I think, you know, I think obviously the Red Bulls are the better team, uh, at least throughout this season. 
But I do think that, you know, Inter Miami, they've been working, whatever. They've been practicing these past couple of weeks. They, they're they desperate, obviously, because what is this, a five-game losing streak now? Um, they, they're they just, they're ready. They need to win, especially they're about to go into the very tough, uh, well, this starts the tough part of their schedule. So I think they get the 1-1 draw. There, okay, interesting, interesting. I have predicted Inter Miami to end this losing streak, at least on a couple of occasions, and they haven't. You're saying that they end the losing streak, but they still extend this winless run. I'm going Correct. to say one, one. I'm going to say that they lose. I don't see them beating the Red Bulls, who are in seventh place in the Eastern Conference. Who you know, not a great team, but they're good at what they do. They have a clear identity away from home for Inter Miami. I think the challenge is going to be a big one. Maybe the performance is better, but I don't know if they'll win. I think. Uh, Two to one defeat. Two to one defeat to the New York Red Bulls. Who's the, who's the goal scorer for Miami then? Top of your head. Just drilling you right now. Give me. I'm speaking right now, so you have time to think. So the people are like, "Oh man, Franco's gonna come out with a great answer." I was gonna say Gonzalo Higuain, but just to make it interesting, Robbie Robinson off the bench. Nice. I nice. think that, that that'll be the goal the Inter Miami gets. Kobe, let's take a quick break. We'll come back to wrap up the show with our Q&A session, your first ever Q&A session, and our final thoughts after this. Kobe, it is Q and A time. Your first ever one. How excited are you? Man, I'm ready, man. This is like this is everything. The Q and A <laughs> session is the beautiful way to end this podcast. First question comes from Jason Siegel, big fan of the pod. In fact, it's likely the best part of being an Inter Miami fan. Low bar, I know. Actually, it's kind of sweet. It's a backhanded compliment, but hey, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Hey, I'll take that. That's actually kind of sweet. That that might go into our Hall of Fame of tweets. We don't have one, but we might make one after that. Anyway, the tweet continues. Like many other season ticket holders, the team's outreach to us and the fans have been limited. If you were GMs for a day, what would you do to help garner support other than win? Interesting question. Kobe, do you want to start or do you want me to start? You can go ahead and start with this one. So, if I'm GM, so that means on the business side, what would I do to help draw up support? I mean, I think parking would definitely be one thing I would do. I think parking is a it's pretty expensive for for the for the in game experience, even for season ticket holders. And I mean, I could piece together reasons why or or come up with reasons why maybe that is and obviously the money that they lost last year they need to recuperate in some way shape or form or in multiple ways shapes and forms so i think this is maybe one but maybe i'd I'd reduce parking or give free parking um to to season ticket holders i think a care package of sorts is absolutely well overdue so that would definitely be something that i would do if i was the gm you know i don't know a jersey for each ticket that's on there, plus you know some other goodies. Obviously, off the top of my head, I can't think of what the goodies would be, but something along those lines. A care package and, and maybe some reduced to free parking because, look, at the end of the day, you want you, you need your season ticket holders to, to stick around for the long haul and with the results happening as they are and this going on from year two starting to head towards year three, some people might withdraw or not want to spend that same type of money going forward. So I think... Compensating those fans and trying to keep them on on board is is the best way to do so. And again, but this is just off the top of my head in this moment. I haven't put a whole lot of thought. But those are just some some ideas that come to mind uh, right off the top. Yeah, see, I was gonna go more of a joking route. Like I was gonna be <laughs> like, "Hey, yo, David, stop watching the Euros. Get back to America and like shake some hands, kiss some babies, you know, do all that fun <laughs> stuff." Because obviously, people love that stuff. But no, I, I think. Kind of going in line with what you said, but more broadly, more like game day specific. Um, and also, I, I think the one, and this is kind of like a coaching, but also a GM thing, occasionally have like open practices to the fans. Mm-hmm. I, 
I, I think more so with the NFL, they have, you know, especially they have it more so during like preseason. They have like preseason practices open to fans. I think if you're really trying to, you know, connect with fans in that way, maybe once, I know they're not going to do this, maybe once every, what, every two months have a, a designated day to, you know, have the fans come in and watch a practice and, and maybe, you know, they can sign the play some players can sign some autographs and, you sure. know, make, make it like a, uh, it can be for season ticket holders. It can be yeah. for like, regular fans, like make an event out of it. Maybe like once every two to three months, maybe like during a break like this, like you have these breaks, maybe, you know, have it open up a practice during the break where you can you know, open it up. I know it's difficult with COVID and whatnot. So. Okay. Well, next question comes from Joseph E. And he says, so we're on a losing streak. Steve Brenner mentioned he'd give Phil a season at least. My question is, how many games do we have to lose in order for Phil to get fired righteously? And he puts righteously in uh, quotation marks and then puts in parentheses in Brenner's opinion. Also, Franco, how much do you think? He follows up with a second tweet saying, by the way, I'm not calling for Phil to get fired. I know this roster sucks, but if a team can't improve throughout the season, there's got to be coaching issues. So, look, I don't think Phil Neville's getting fired. I don't think it's going to happen whether he plays, you know, poor, whether they don't get a win in five games, ten games. I think they're going to give him time, and he's obviously got connections with David Beckham, close ties with David Beckham. So, I don't think he's getting fired, if, even if they go on a ten-game losing streak. Now, well, maybe if they go on a 15-game losing streak, then then we're talking something else. So, I mean, I guess that's your answer then. 15-game losing streak, something of the like. But even then, I think it's tough, man. I don't think David Beckham's going to ask uh, someone he's he's close with, someone that he's pretty much hand-picked. I don't think... I don't see it happening. I just don't see it happening. I also don't think Inter Miami will lose 15 straight. I think at some point they'll they'll have a, a moment where they'll win a game or, or at least get a draw. So, um, that's that's my those are my thoughts. Mm. I'm with you. I don't think he gets – if Phil Neville's let go, fired, mutually agrees to part ways, whatever language you want to use, uh, it won't happen this season. Uh, how often do you see an MLS, a coach, get let go in their first year? It just, ha- it just happened with Chris year. Armas. It just happened to Levy. But that, that like, like, to your point, is uh, doesn't happen very often. He only got 11 games and was let go, but that doesn't happen uh, that often in MLS. I feel like even with that, like it's rare in that sense, but also like – We've seen you and other teams that didn't go the best, so um, I feel like he's here for uh, for the rest of the season, for better or worse. I'm not even like I'm not even saying he shouldn't be. I'm just saying that's how it's probably going to be. And it would take I would say a uh, remarkably bad start to next season um, to I think to even consider him not being the coach. I would say within like first six or seven games. From, from, it would have to be- you're talking about from a, a, a sporting director or general. Uh, you know the, the the executive standpoint. So obviously, from the outside, we could say at the end of this year, if, you know, we think he should stay or not. But I think yeah, he, yeah, yeah. I'm saying, I'm saying from, I'm saying from their perspective, I right. think they'll even give him the benefit of the doubt of starting, no matter what happens this year, unless it was like, like you said, a 15 game losing streak, which will not happen. At least uh, I don't think will happen. Um, it would take a remarkably bad start to next season for I think the executive to be like, yeah, we may Phil may not be the guy. I think they'll give him this season. Um, and I think they'll give him at least the starts of next season, depending on how this season goes, obviously, um, and how it ends. Next question, Kobe, comes from Elder Bar. He's got a few, actually. He said, he says, I thought the Academy scouted top talent in the country. Why are the Academy products not as well-formed as the other club's young talent? When do current DP contracts expire? How soon can Gonzalo be sold, Pizarro traded, and Blaze retired? So... I'll start. I'll start there if it's okay. Wait, wait, um, wait, 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 wait. There's a lot. Wait, 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 there's a wait, lot. Wait, 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 is he calling for Blaze Versace? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think he is. Wow. Um, oh, yeah. Our, our Q and A sessions can get pretty dark, given the state of the team. So, I mean, it's not that dark, but obviously, you know, the the sentiments are are pretty strong towards what's happening with with the team. Uh, so, Elder Bar, why is the academy not forming? as good a talent as you might expect. Look, the Academy's still fairly young, right? Compared to others around the United States, enter Miami's Academy, all the processes, the structures, everything is, you know, those things are still being adjusted and fine-tuned and, and really established. And I think it'll take a bit of time before we see it churn out more talent. Obviously, there's talent in South Florida, but getting the structures in place, the people in place, I think that's part of the reason why 
things are still not not at an ideal level or where you know maybe some people would like it to be currently. Now, when do the DP contracts expire and when can they be sold, traded, or retired? I mean, when could it happen? It could happen as early as tomorrow if that's what they decided or that's what Inter Miami decided. Um, but obviously, it's, that's not going to be the case. I've said this on other pods. Inter Miami could buy out one of the three DPs by next year if they're all still on the on the books. There's rumors, and Steve Brenner has reported multiple times on this podcast that Pizarro is being shopped around, especially to clubs in Liga and Mekis, so there's a chance he could leave as soon as this summer. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. They could leave as soon as tomorrow in all the different ways you mentioned, but I don't think that's realistic. I think they're here, especially Iguain and Matuidi, for at least the rest of this season. Yeah, I think uh, the first question, what I believe was, it was about the academy products. I'm kind of with you on this one. I don't want to repeat too much of what you just said. It's a young academy system. Uh, we're just now seeing the first, you know, academy products make their way onto the um, Inter Miami's MLS roster. And obviously, we've only seen Edison Escona on the field. Uh, Felipe Valencia is obviously, he's now with the USL team for Lauderdale CF. And then Ian Frey, he's coming back from ACL injury. So the, uh, the system's young. We jet, we're only seeing one product of the system even make it to the MLS roster. I'm sure as the system grows, especially with these next five years, we'll see more of the academy players, not just playing more with the Fort Lauderdale CF team, but also um, on Air Miami's team. I would, I would expect more of it. And you'll see a bigger sample of the academy uh, system on the MLS roster. I think the second question was, when do the DP, DP contract expire? When will Blaze retire? When will Gonzalo stop smoking cigarettes? Like it was, it was like a very like very deep question. Um, <laughs> in terms of like the official, like when do the contracts expire? I don't know about Pizarro's. I'm pretty sure Blaze Matuidi's contract expires after next season, after the 2022 season. And I think I'm Iguain pretty is the same. I think he wins. Is yeah, the same. yeah. I'm pretty sure both Blaze and Gonzalo their contracts expire. Um, after next season. In fact, Moss did say, he told The Athletic, and it was even reported beforehand, that Blaze signed a two-and-a-half-year contract with Miami. He obviously signed that last summer. Last summer was the half year. This is one-and-a-half years, so next year will be the end of two-and-a-half years. So, And I'm pretty sure it's the same for Gonzalo. It was reported that he signed through the 2022 season. So there's your official answer, but I don't I don't know about, Piz, uh, about Pizarro's. I've, I've gone on radio shows that he said, I don't think he's getting transferred this year. I'm sticking with it. I'm not saying I don't think it could happen. I'm just saying I don't think it will happen. Pizarro, that is. Okay. Next question comes from Gabe P. Is there a way that the fans can buy some percentage that will become available if Marcelo Claude <laughs> leaves? I would love to be part of the club as a socio. Why isn't any of the youth playing in the worst team in the league if we will suck, maybe give a try to the kids, Ascona and Curry. Look, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Inter Miami's young players like Ascona, they have their flashes, their spurts of you know quality where you're like, wow, you know, maybe they should be getting more time. But I think physically, they're not there yet for a league like MLS, where you need to be physically in a good standing and you've seen it with even Gonzalo Higuain you know like he's a he's an older player a veteran player an experienced player and he's struggling with his fitness you know in terms of conditioning and probably even physicality you know I going back to the play against DC United in the 3-0 loss at home where he there was one moment where he's running towards the ball in the attacking third and he's lined up against Andy Nahar who's much smaller than him and Gonzalo Higuain goes to shoulder barge him and Watching it live, I was like, oh man, Gonzalo Higuain's going to knock him down. Gonzalo Higuain ended up getting knocked down. He bounced off Nahar, and Nahar won the ball. And it was, like, I think maybe that's part of the reason, and I'm not joking here. I think that's part of the reason maybe they were like, wow, he's not in good physical condition. We need to, like, get him on a plan, and we need him to get in better better shape because he, sh- I mean, Gonzalo Higuain should not be getting knocked off the ball by Andy Nahar, who is much smaller than him. But anyway... Uh, I think that that's the reason why you don't, you're not going to see these young players all that much this year. Maybe towards the end of the season, if the season's already in the, you know, there's no chance of making the playoffs. Maybe you'll see them then. But I think that the plan is to have them mature with Fort Lauderdale CF and let them build themselves physically. 
Because, look, they, they might be doing well at times with Fort Lauderdale, but that's still at least a level or two below what MLS is. So not not exactly the same. And, again, spurts are just spurts. Being able to perform over a longer, longer period and sustain that level is a completely different challenge. Now... Uh, the other the other part of the question was you know is there a way that fans can buy a percentage of of cloud is stake I don't believe that that's in the plans I haven't heard anything of the like I know that that sounds I know that's good in theory and that there are teams that do things like that but I don't think Inter Miami will be doing that any anytime soon start a GoFundMe like that's my advice. <laughs> start a GoFundMe <laughs> and um, I feel like what what team is that? I feel like it's the Packers that's like the Green Bay Packers that are like owned by the community or, or something along those lines. Yeah, no, I'm here with I'm here for this idea. Start a GoFundMe, start to raise some money, see what you can get. I'm not gonna shoot it down like Franco is. I'm supporting you right now. I'm supporting your entrepreneurship. I believe in you. <laughs> I'm not shooting it down. I just don't think it's gonna happen. I just don't think it's gonna happen. No, neither um, do I. Uh, uh, <laughs> we've got two more. We've got two more questions, Kobe. One comes from Gerald or Heran. And he says, seeing as though we are worse than last year with a better roster on paper, how much longer do you think until we start looking for a coaching change? So this is a question we get actually very regularly on this pod. It's about the coaching, questions about Phil Neville, next coach up. Look, Inter Miami just went through a coaching change, and I agree that Phil Neville's not doing a great job. We've talked on it on this pod. We've gone in-depth on it in this pod with Kobe about Phil Neville not maximizing the players he has at his disposal but I don't, again, to reiterate what we said a couple of questions ago, I don't think they're going to can Phil Neville this season. Regardless of the results, it would take a record amount of consecutive losses for them to even think about it. But that's just my opinion. I'm just going to say it, frankly. Uh, unless something astronomically awful happens, and especially not so much on the field, but more so behind the scenes, happens because of Phil Neville... Phil Neville is here to stay this season, and he's here to stay to the for at least the start of next season. Uh, I could, I may be wrong, and if I'm wrong, you guys can Cole takes me on Twitter, or whatever. Phil Neville will be the coach in Miami this year, rest of this year, and the start of next year. There it Dang. is. Kobe Price has laid down the gauntlet there, and he's putting himself on a limb. Just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, I just that's just my take on how MLS goes from what I've learned, and I think. They're going to give him at least the benefit of the doubt, especially when you consider the Neville Beckham friendship partnership in business. That is, um, yeah, I, I, that, that's my take. Uh, he's going to be here at least for the next season. I like Phil Neville from a media perspective. Like he's As great, do I. He's a, he's a great talker, gives you a lot of insight, um, affable, likable in that in those ways, and he he banter's about as well. So. But from a coaching standpoint, I'm not convinced with what I've seen so far. There's time to turn things around still, but so far, I don't like what I've seen from the coaching staff this season. Now, again, I don't think, one, because he's got ties with David Beckham, that he'll be let go. And two, because you don't constantly want to be recycling coaches or changing coaches that Inter Miami is going to push the reset button Again, even if the season is pretty, pretty poor. So we'll see. I do want to I do want to leave this one and we can I'm just going to leave it there for listeners to think about for you to think about Kobe. I'm going to leave this one like a like a low cross across the box for someone to finish off with what they think. But we won't dissect it on this week's pod. But how much do you think the players because players are obviously they pay attention to what goes on with the team day in and day out. Right. Obviously. How much do you think? they weigh into Phil Neville's relationship with David Beckham. Like, do you think that there are players on this team that are like, this guy has gotten this job because he's David Beckham's friend and that they don't buy into his message or they don't believe he's got the credentials or they don't... Again, maybe there's none. Maybe there are some. Because just like on the outside, there was a perspective from some fans, from some media saying, hey, you know, he's getting this job because of his ties to David Beckham. Maybe there are players in that locker room that feel that way. I don't know. I'll just leave that as a thought or a talking point for for you all out there. Last question, and it just came in. is from Fighting Herons, and it's a question we've already answered. I probably should have joined them toge- together with the, the previous one, but it just came in. He says, when are the DP contracts expiring? Are any of them signed past this season? Pretty sure Gonzalo is. Yes, they are all signed past this season. Again, to reiterate something that Steve Brenner and Primo 
has reported he said he has said that Inter Miami is looking to sell Rodolfo Pizarro. So we'll see what happens with regards to him and the other two. Kobe, that wraps up the Q and A session. Thank you for joining us, brother. But of course, you can't let you go without giving us your final thoughts because we got to hear your Kobe Price's final thoughts before he leaves the beat because this is officially uh, Kobe's welcoming and farewell to Miami Total Football Radio. No, just kidding. We can have you back later on, um, maybe maybe at the end of the season to, to summarize everything that's gone on. But what are your final thoughts, brother? Yeah, no, man. I would love to be back on. This has been fun. You know, I've enjoyed being on uh, Miami Tuto, uh, Total Football Radio. Uh, <laughs> that's my best shot. <laughs> but no, uh, I mean, it's been fun covering the team. I'll obviously keep pay- keep paying attention, uh, especially I'm going to be back on. But no, this team is in a tough, tough place right now. Just in a tough spot in terms of record, in terms of form. Um, I think they looked they looked better coming out of the last break than they did going into it. So even if they could repeat that, you know, coming out of the break looking better than they did going into the break, that will obviously bode well in terms of, you know, attractive soccer, appeasing fans. But if you look at the schedule and you look forward past the New York Red Bulls games, it's looking rough. So they need to be better just to even get... We're going to keep that in there. I want Franco to keep that in there just because that's the state of inner Miami. I saw, <laughs> yeah, that was I like called. big lightning, man. It was big lightning that happened, and then it just just came down. Then, the thunder. Thunder. Yeah. That's why I, 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 could, I could see the lightning, so I was like, yeah, I'm going to pause. So I know the thunder's coming. Um, yeah, I, I just think they, they all need to be better, not just because, obviously, like, you know, you want to win games, but the competition is going to get stiffer, and they can't. They, they just can't – even they though they look better, they cannot repeat that same form just because it's not going to be good enough. It hasn't been good enough all year, and it's especially not going to be good enough against the competition they'll face coming out of this break. And, that, and that's something I don't think we got to touch on, um, which I, I meant to, is that this game against New York Red Bulls starts a stretch of matches where they play three games in eight, nine days, and they follow this game up with a match against the New England Revolution, which is towards the top of the Eastern Conference, as well as the Philadelphia Union. So – this is going to be a pretty challenging test, a pretty high benchmark to see if Inter Miami can start making improvements or if it's going to be further and further pushed down into the Eastern Conference basement. I will say my final thought is, Kobe, thank you so much for joining us. Even when you've, you've you know, officially left the beat, you've still come on and, and taken the invitation, which I thank you for. We will miss you on the beat. I will miss you on the beat. Someone to banter about with and have in and out with on road trips, which (laughs) we only did once, but hey, it was a good time. Um, But my final thought with regards to the team is something we didn't touch on, which is the signing of Indiana Vasilev. He's a player, a young player who's looking for minutes, looking for consistent playing time. He's been bouncing around the lower divisions of England, third and fourth division as of late from parent club or his the club that owns his contract which is Aston Villa he's here with Inter Miami on loan through the rest of the year I would say don't expect a whole lot out of him I think he's an option that will come off the bench mostly and have chances to add something to the attack but I don't think he's going to be a game changer or a huge difference maker just another piece for Phil Noble to, to use off the bench, which, hey, at this point, Inter Miami can use all the help it can get in the attack. So it's definitely a plus that they have at least another option. But that does it for this week's show. Thank you guys so much for listening. Again, thank you to Kobe Price for joining us. And Primo Steve Brenner will not be in the house next week again. We will have another special guest lined up, someone that also covers Inter Miami. Uh, but I'll leave that as a surprise for next week. La Ejo Picando, as we say, we'll leave that that cross across the face of goal for someone to, to see if they can smash it home by figuring out who it is. But we'll see how Inter Miami does this weekend. For Kobe Price, I am Franco Penizo. This is Miami Total Football Radio, and I'll talk to you guys again.